The Unicorn, A Mythological Investigation By Robert Brown Forward. This little brochure is a contribution, however humble, to the science of psychology, not merely a notice of curious, still less of idle, fancies. The study of man to be successful must commence with his earlier, that is to say, simpler, phases. The solar myth, vaguely so called, is often ridiculed but never by anyone who has carefully examined it. And the history of the lion and the unicorn exhibits one aspect of the ideas of time and cosmic order as shown in the most obvious divisions of period, day and night. The indirect influence of our present civilization and the repetition of phenomena produce a sadly deadening effect upon the vast majority of minds as regards appreciation of the external world and render it extremely difficult for us to place ourselves near the mental standpoint of primitive, or even of archaic, man. We do not wonder at the sun, or at the genius which has contrived by the use of only ten signs to express any number, or indeed at anything which, though marvelous in itself, is somewhat familiar to the senses and ordinary apprehension. Even scientific research often resolves itself into an anatomical dissection, which is equivalent to the knowledge of the way about a cathedral, combined with an appreciation of the principles of masonry, but accompanied by total ignorance of, or utter indifference to, the real forces which produced the building. With respect to the evidence adduced in the particular case, its combined weight is specially to be considered, the various points are not links in a chain, the failure in any one of which is fatal, but items in a description. As, according to Prof. Ludwig Noir, the discovery of the axe assured the triumph of the kingdom of man upon earth, so the idea of time, solar, day, lunar, week month, and sidereal, year, was a mighty mental axe with which thought hewed its way to noble victories. I treat here merely of the day and of that which by division makes it, the night, and of but one mythic phase of these, yet, be it remembered, the idea of day contained the germ of the idea of eternity, so far as such a concept is possible to man. For time is division, a day the primary division, and eternity merely infinitely reduplicated time. Barton upon Humber. October 1, 1881. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, Share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Section 1. The Heraldic Unicorn. The science of heraldry has faithfully preserved to modern times various phases of some of those remarkable legends, which, based upon a study of natural phenomena, exhibit the process whereby the greater part of mythology has come into existence. There we find the solar griffin, one the solar phoenix, two, a demi-eagle displayed issuing from flames of fire, three the solar lion, and the lunar unicorn, which two latter noble creatures now harmoniously support the royal arms. I propose in the following pages to examine the myth of the unicorn, the wild, white, fierce, chaste moon, whose two horns, unlike those of mortal creatures, are indissolubly twisted into one. The creature that endlessly fights with the lion to gain the crown, Kappa Omicron Royupsilon Phi, or summit of heaven which neither may retain, and whose brilliant horn drives away the darkness and evil of the night. Even as we find in the myth that, venom is defended by the horn of an Nicorn. For as the moon rules the sea and water, five so the horn of the unicorn is said to purify the streams and pools, and we are told that other animals will not drink until this purification is made. For the unicorn ere he slakes his thirst, like the sinking moon, dips his horn in water. As the moon, Artemis Selene, is the, queen and huntress, chaste and fair, so is, the maiden unicorn, six, in the classical and middle ages the emblem of chastity. Seven, their inviolable attachment to virginity, has occasioned them to become the guardian hieroglyphic of that virtue, eight according to Upton, quoted by Dalloway, the unicorn, capitor cum arte mirabili. Puella Virgo in Silva Proponitor Salac Relinquitor, Ca Adveniens de Polita Omni Ferocitate Casti Corporis Pudicitium in Virgin Venerator, Capuc Sum in Sinu Pueli Imponit, Sic Ca Soperatus Deprehenditor of Venatoribus Eti Oxidator. 
Vel in Regali Palacio ad spectandum exhibitor. Dalloway conjectures that the tester or armor for horses' heads in the center of which a long spike was fixed, suggested the idea of a beast so defended by nature. With respect to this view it may suffice to remark that the unicorn is found on the archaic cylinder seals of Babylonia and Assyria 9 as well as on the horn of Ulf 10 whereas, the chanfron with a spike projecting from it was adopted in 1467. Probably this is the earliest date 11 the testier is first mentioned in the time of Edward I, and, chanfron or chamfrains, pieces of steel or leather to cover the horse's face, 12 came into vogue about the end of the 13th century. Chanfris is an obsolete North Country term meaning very fierce. Point thirteen. The lion is the only animal that appears on the shields in the roll of arms known as the roll of King Henry III. The unicorn, however, although not found on any shield in the roll of Karlovarok, is mentioned by the herald who composed the MS siege to Karlovarok, now in the British Museum. He says. Robert Le Seigneur de Clifford. A key raisons Don Confort. De S.E.S. Enemies in Combre. Touts Les Foys qui remember. Qui puet de son noble lineage. Iscos pregna tizmoinage. Co ben e nobleman commence. Cum sil qui est de la semence. Le conti maresco le noble. Qui par de la constantinable. Al unicorn se combati. E de saus li mort lue body. Robert the Lord of Clifford. To whom reason gives consolation. To overcome his enemies. Every time he calls to memory. The fame of his noble lineage. He calls Scotland to bear witness. That he begins well and nobly. As one who is of the race. Of the noble Earl Marshal. Who beyond Constantinople. Fought with the unicorn. And struck him dead beneath him. 14. The griffin, it may be observed, appears in the role as a charge. Simon de Montague. Co avoit bunier escu. De ind, o griffon rampant de or fin. Simon de Montague. Who had a banner and shield. Blue, with a griffin rampant of fine gold. 15. Sir Harris Nicholas observes that, the exploit which is said to have been performed by the Earl Marshal at Constantinople in slaying a unicorn, which probably referred to a tradition familiar at the time of some deed of one of the Marshal family in the Holy Land, is not elsewhere commemorated. 16. In opposition to the opinion that the unicorn could be captured by means of the stratagem above mentioned, it was more generally held that, like the griffin, 17, the unicorn is never taken alive. And the reason being demanded, it is answered, that the greatness of his mind is such, that he chose Seth rather to die than to be taken alive. 18 The real reason why both griffin and unicorn are safe from capture is sufficiently obvious. Nut is said amongst other, naval devices, to have, exhibited unicorns, centaurs, dragons, lions, dolphins, and human figures. The swift unicorn, either Anglo-Saxon or Dane, was obliged to fly before the two Norman leopards, or perhaps, lions, 19. Hence the naturalization of the emblematical unicorn in Scotland, and its return into England under the Stuart dynasty. 20. The earliest extant example of the unicorn as a supporter in the royal arms of Scotland, appears to be that which occurs in the royal achievement carved above the gateway of Rothsey Castle. The Lion King of Arms, who examined it carefully last summer, told me that this carving appeared to him to be contemporaneous with the part of the building in which it is inserted, which, considering the style of the architecture and various entries in the exchequer rolls relative to the building of Rothsey Castle, he was disposed to assign to the time of Robert II. Or 3. 1380 to 1400, in 1486 or 1487 two gold coins were struck, value respectively eighteenths. And nines and called the unicorn and half-unicorn, from the circumstance that they bore on one side the figure of a unicorn siegeant supporting the royal escutcheon. In the same reign, that of James III. we first find unicorn persevent. 21. The following instances, amongst many, exhibit the unicorn as a charge. The arms of Sir John Rest, 
Lord Mayor of London in 1516, are azure, on a fess, between three crosses Milroan, or, a unicorn couchant, gules. This position of the unicorn is very unusual. Mythologically, the bronze red setting moon. The family of Harling bore Argent, a unicorn segent, sable, mythologically, the moon in eclipse. The family of Musterton bore gules, a unicorn with dexter leg raised, i.e., tripping, argent, mythologically, the moon walking in brightness, 22. The family of Farrington bore sable, three unicorns, current, argent, one and one and one. Mythologically, the wild white moon of triple aspect, 23 flying through the dark clouds. The family of Shelley bore gules, three unicorns heads cooped, by two and one. The tincture of the unicorn is generally argent, i.e. The ordinary color of the moon, lookethy, the white goddess, 24 the Semitic Labana, the pale shiner, as distinguished from the burning, golden Tamuz Adonis, the Akkadian Demuzi or only sun, of the diurnal heaven. 25 The proper color of the moon we in heraldry take to be argent, both for the weakness of the light, and also for the distinction betwixt the blazoning of it and the sun. And therefore when we blazon by planets, we name gold soul, and silver luna, 26. One or two crests in which the unicorn appears are of special interest inasmuch as most archaic ideas seem to have been unconsciously preserved in them. Thus, the crest of the Bickerstaff family is the sun with sable rays, i.e., the nocturnal sun, surmounted by a unicorn rampant, i.e., the nightly triumph of the moon over the sun. In a variant form of this device the unicorn is statant. The crest of the courteous family is a unicorn passant, between four trees, mythologically, a most interesting allusion to the archaic myth of the grove of the underworld. Point 27. The heraldic moon is either in crescent, i.e. the new moon with horns turned towards the dexter side of the shield, in complement, i.e., the full moon, decrescent, i.e., the waning moon with horns turned towards the sinister side of the shield, or in detriment, i.e., when eclipsed. 28 In this state it is emblazoned sable. The face in the orb 29 is shown at times. James I introduced the Scottish unicorn, Argent, as the sinister supporter of the royal arms, and Gillam describes the arms of Charles I. As supported by a lion rampan, SOL, and an unicorn, Luna, 30. Section 2. Opinions respecting the terrestrial existence of the unicorn. As the unicorn was not found in the flesh near home, and as its terrestrial existence was firmly believed in, it became necessary to locate the animal in some distant region. Perhaps the most celebrated of his supposed haunts is the English version of the Old Testament, where the word, unicorn, in deference to the muomicron nuomicron caparo omega of the LXX, the unicornus of the Vulgate, has unfortunately been introduced in several passages. The animal really referred to is the rem, the Assyrian rimu or wild bull, respecting which the Reverend W. Houghton observes. The species of wild cattle hunted by the Assyrian monarchs is either the Bos primigenius or some closely allied species. It is apparently identical with the gigantic urus, which Caesar and the Roman legions saw in the forests of Belgium and Germany, 31. Thus we read, he hath as it were the towering horns, lit. Eminences, of a wild bull, 32. And again. Glorious is the firstling of his bullock, and his horns, i.e., two horns, are like the horns of a wild bull, 33 here the LXX. Absurdly read Caparo Alpha Tau Alpha Mu Omicron Nu Omicron Caparo Omicron Omega Tau Omicron Tau Caparo Alpha Tau Alpha Alpha Tau Omicron, and our translators render the singular by the plural to preserve consistency. The other passages in the Old Testament here the unicorn is mentioned are similar. The cuneiform ideograph for the rem is or, each of which forms show the two projecting horns in front. Compare our letter A, originally the Phoenician and Moabite stone, i.e., the rude representation of a bull's horns. So the form, i.e., doubled, is the plural, cattle, which, when domesticated, appear, i.e., in an enclosure. Pliny observes that the unicorn, cannot be taken alive. 
34 and Gillam remarks that some have made doubt whether there be any such beast as this or not. But the great esteem of his home, in many places to be seen, may take away that needless scruple. 35 horns, no doubt, can be seen in various places, and the spiral tusk of the narwhal was accustomed to be sold as the real horn of the unicorn. And as an accredited part of that animal, forming, a supposed, direct proof of its existence, it used to fetch a very high price. 36. The heirs of the Chancellor to Christian Frisius of Denmark valued one at 8,000 imperials. In an inventory of the 16th century, we have, item, two unicorn's bones, garnished with gold. An unicorn horn at Somerset House, valued at 500 L, occurs in the inventory of the plate of King Charles I. 37. When the whale fishery was established, the real owner of the horn was discovered, and the unicorn left still enveloped in mystery. The name Monodon, one tooth, is not strictly correct, as the narwhal possesses two of these tusks, one on each side of its head. 38. These twisted ivory tusks made excellent unicorn's horns. The next animal in this competition is the oryx, a name used by Aristotle, who probably refers to the Indian Nilga, supposed by some to be the unicorn of the Old Testament, and having long straight horns, which when seen in profile exactly cover each other, and so give a unicornic appearance. There is in the museum at Bristol a stuffed antelope from Caffraria, presented in 1828. It is of the shape and size of a horse, with two straight taper horns, so nearly united, that in profile it shows only a single horn. 39 The Oryx, however, is no unicorn. Next, as to the rhinoceros. Pausanias describes the African species, Ethiopian bulls, which they call, nose horn, Iotanu kappa epsilon rho omega, because each has a horn at the end of its nose. And another small one above it, the rhinoceros, Gemino cornu, of Marshall, but on its head there are no horns. 40 The Kitloa, a kind of black rhinoceros, is two horned, as are the Muchocho and Kobayaba, the two white kinds. The Indian rhinoceros, however, is one horned. But, the so called horn is not a true horn, being nothing but a process of the skin, and composed of a vast assemblage of hairs. 41 That Indian ass of Aristotle, which he describes as having but one horn, is probably the one horned rhinoceros, the horn of which, like that supposed to belong to the unicorn proper, has always been highly valued. And regarded as a detectant of poison. But no kind of rhinoceros at all resembles the various representations of the unicorn, is an opponent of the lion, or answers generally to the mythical character of the mysterious creature. Aldrovandus, amongst his other monsters and curiosities, speaks of a unicornic animal called the camphorch, which apparently not being one of the fittest, has not survived. Apropos of the Lusus Naturi, it may be remembered that Plutarch mentions how, a ram's head with only one horn, was brought to Pericles from one of his farms, which occasioned a prophecy that he would attain to supreme power in the state. 42 Here we trench on the symbolical, and so are reminded of Daniel's goat with, a notable horn between his eyes, 43 namely that Alexander, who, strange to say, adopting the horns of Ammon, reappears in the Quran 44 as Dolkarnan. The Two-Horned Having noticed the various actually existing animals that have been named in this connection, it only remains to add that the unicorn has been prudently relegated to those remote regions which are, or rather were, the special abodes of many wondrous creatures. Amongst these favored localities was the great Hercynian forest, in which, according to a report repeated by Caesar, est bas, a vague term applied to any large and strange animal, serve figura. Cujus media fronte inter oras unum cornu existit, excelsius magisc directum his, quae nobis nota sunt, cornibus. 45. The vague description of Pliny, 46 seems to point to a kind of rhinoceros. Cardan, following Pliny, with advantages, describes the unicorn as rare, with the hair of a weasel, the head of a deer, the body of a horse, thin legs and inane, and one horn three cubits in length. 47. Garcias has preserved a very interesting incident, namely, that the unicorn was endowed with a wonderful horn, which it would sometimes turn to the left and right, at others' rays, 
and then again depress. 48 The progress of the lunar horn, of course, here supplies the basis of the myth. Oppian, alien, and many others refer either to the unicorn itself, or to unicornic creatures. Hesychios defines the monikeros vaguely as theta eta rho omicron nu phi omicron beta epsilon rho nu. 49 So it is prudently, as, an animal which has by nature one horn. 50. Section 3. The Unicorn in Archaic Art. A unicornic animal frequently appears in archaic art, but whilst asserting that all non-natural animal figures or partly human figures when used in a religious connection are symbolical. I do not for a moment contend that all unicornic animal figures represent the moon. But merely that the creature whose form is familiar to us in heraldry, a kind of horse stag or antelope, is a lunar emblem. Thus on a Babylonian cylinder 51 representing Bel encountering Tiamat, who, whatever else she may represent, is the dragon of chaos, the monster who rises on her hind legs, has a beak, crest, wings and a single horn. And is altogether very similar to one of the seven wicked spirits that make war against the moon god Sin, as the representative of cosmic order. 52 This latter creature, a reduplication of the Dracontic Tiamat, rises similarly on its hind legs, and has a crest, wings, and single horn. 53 Tiamat herself is elsewhere represented as two-horned. 54 The horn has various meanings in symbolism, 55 the majority of which are not of a lunar character. But the following examples of the unicorn, its allies, and opponents, are, in my opinion, certainly more or less connected with lunar symbolism. I, on an Assyrian sardonic seal in the Louvre Museum, 56 is represented a crowned personage, behind whom is a serpent erect on its tail. His right hand grasps a dagger, and his left the horn of a unicorn goat, standing on its hind legs with the four legs bent and head turned from him, the mouth touching the conventional tree, above the animal, the crescent moon. The king is about to slay the unicorn, beneath the four legs of which is a lozenge. With this design must be considered. 2. Another Babylonian gem figured by Lagard, 57 on which is shown the king in the same attitude, grasping by the head a crowned and apparently human-headed and winged goat, in the same attitude as the unicorn goat. Beneath the four legs of the crowned goat is a representation, apparently the yoni, the equivalent of the lozenge. And above the creature the crescent moon and behind it the conventional tree, on the other side of which is a goat in the same attitude as the crowned anima, except that its head is regarded fifty-eight towards the tree, as in no. I. The goat's two horns are close together so as to form but one, and beneath its four legs is a figure composed of two crescent moons adderst and fastened together. All the animals are salient. With both these designs let us consider. 3. An Assyrian cylinder 59 of great interest, said to portray Merodach, or Bel, armed for the conflict with the dragon, but which I prefer to call, the sun god and the moon god arranging the preservation of cosmic order. On each side of the representation is a palm tree, in front of the one on the right hand Merodach, the brilliance of the sun, stands fully armed, on a leopard-like animal, sixty in above his crowned head is the solar star, the key to the symbolism. Merodach's right hand is raised as if in oath on a treaty, as is the right hand of a human figure in another long garment, in front of and apparently conversing with him. Behind this second figure are two unicorn goats, countersalient, with heads regarded as in the last example. Above the unicorns and the second figure, which I believe represents the moon god, is a crescent moon, curiously divided into three parts, sixty-one by what seem to be handles. Beyond the unicorns is a second palm tree. The unarmed moon commissions the warrior sun to go forth to the great contest. In all three instances we find the unicorn, the crescent moon, and the tree. 62 In the first two representations the unicorn is being attacked and overcome by a personage whose crown and attire are very similar to those of Merodach. The type is evidently a familiar one. The unicorn's horn in each case almost touches the tree, to which its head always turns. In no. 2. The man-goat strives with the man. The goat, the reduplication of the former, does not, 
there is sometimes peace between the unicorn and its assailant, and sometimes war. In no. 3. The leopard, which, as it could be trained to hunt, was a fit type of the hunter sun, is at peace with the unicorns, whilst sun and moon consult together against darkness and chaos. The remarkable position of the two unicorns indicates, I think, the monthly cycling progress of the moon, there and back, counter-salient. Reduplication is a noted feature in symbolism. And we have here, 1, the moon god, 2, the crescent moon, 3, the young moon, and, 4, the old moon. The next type to be noticed in this connection consists of a divine personage between two other symbolical beings, whose hands or arms he grasps in a friendly manner. 4. Divine four-winged personage, with round cap on head, and long fringed robe reaching to the ankles, but leaving the right leg exposed as ready for action as in the case of Meridak. 63 His right hand grasps the wrist of an androcephalic winged animal rampant, with human hands but lion's feet, his left hand grasps the right forefoot of a winged unicorn, rampant, with hoofs. Point 64. V. Variant Phase. 65 A similar personage, but without wings, stands in the same attitude between two semi human, Dagonic, semi Piscine, figures, one of which has a large eye, the other has apparently its cap drawn down over the eye. To the right is the winged circle, not solar the familiar type of the head of the Assyrian pantheon. Point 66. 6. Third variant phase. Point 67. A similar personage between two androcephalic, winged, rampant animals. To the right the moon god in his crescent boat above the sacred tree. Point 68. The helmet of the creature next the moon god is horned. In this representation I think we have the demiurge Bel, whose eldest son in the formal pantheon is Sin, the moon god, making a covenant between the sun and moon for the preservation of cosmic order. Point 69 The second creature in No. 6. Is a reduplication of the moon god, whose introduction in his crescent 70 gives the key to the symbolism, whilst preserving the secret of it. The moon god, as Lord of Growth, 71 is stationed immediately over the tree of life. Both sun and moon are sea divinities as in No. V. 72 If this interpretation be correct we have the lunar unicorn, no. V. As the equivalent of the lunar fish and the lunar androcephalic animal. 7. On a Phoenician gem found at Nidus 73 is represented the sun radiate, a large crescent moon, and between the two a small circle, perhaps the planet Venus, whilst below are two rude heads of a unicorn bull and cow. Point 74. 8. A unicorn bull stands near the sacred tree, on the other side of which is a priest with a knife. Point 75. 9. The well known bar leaf at Persepolis called Lion Devouring a Bull is in reality lion attacking a unicorn. The latter animal, semi rampant and regardant, and with only one large horn, is seized behind by the lion. On this group, Professor Rawlinson remarks. This is a representation of a lion seizing and devouring a bull. The latter animal is evidently powerless to offer any resistance to the fierce beast which has sprung upon him from behind. 76 In his agony the bull rears up his foreparts, and turns his head feebly towards his assailant. This favorite group, which the Persian sculptors repeated without the slightest change from generation to generation. 77 The design was favorite because highly archaic and symbolical. No man has ever seen a lion attack a unicorn, but the contest between sun and moon, between day and night, was watched from the first with the closest interest. Sun and moon may equally combine against darkness and chaos, or contend against each other. 78. X A Persian cylinder 79 shows the unicorn goat held in the arms of a divinity, 80 opposite is the sun radiate. 11. Another Assyrian scene from layered 81 shows a man adoring a winged unicorn bull, above which appear the sun radiate, the crescent moon, and also the seven planets. It will be remembered that the unicorn stag is the creature which I regard as especially lunar, the representation shows how familiar is the idea of a unicorn. 12. Tree of Life, Between Two Griffins. 82 This cylinder scene represents the sacred tree 83 between two winged unicorns, 
not griffins, rampant, each turn towards it. The tree is of the archaic palm type. With this may be compared the two unicorns and the palm in no. 3. 13. Cow 84 and calf before a tree, over them the sun and planets. The representation of the animal presents a striking analogy to that of the bull regardant on the coins of Cyberus. Conical Seal 85 The seal in question shows the unicorn cow, or bull, with the usual prominent, lunar, before the tree, and, as frequently, regardant. 86 The horned moon it will of course be remembered, is frequently connected with the bull or cow, indeed more frequently than with the unicorn, and the bull and cow, emblems of increase, are also connected with night as a period of growth. The nocturnal sun, too, is at times bovine, in contradistinction to the diurnal and leonine Sunday 87 we must expect to find frequently a mixture of ideas in a symbolical representation. This unicorn cow, if a cow it be, seems, as shown by the calf, to be cosmogonic as well as lunar, but the old attitude of the head, the prominent eye, the single horn and the tree are still preserved. The maiden unicorn can have no calf. But the old moon is at times seen in the young moon's arms 88 i.e., when in addition to the sunlit portion of the moon, the obscure portion is faintly visible on account of the reflection of the earth shine. Called Lumen Incinerosum, a Cinderella moon. 14. It is convenient to notice next the archaic coinage of Cyberus referred to by Mr. King. Cyberus was colonized from Achaia, B.C. 721, and the coins in question may be placed prior to B.C. 600. Leek describes the type as, bull standing to left, with head reverted, and remarks, this type is probably symbolical of the river Krathis. 89 As in previous instances no attention is paid to the circumstance that the animal, whatever else it may be, is a unicorn, in this case a unicorn bull. I do not absolutely assert that it is a lunar emblem. But it is certainly a link in the chain of unicornic representations, and has faithfully preserved the regardant attitude. As one of a series it is quite unconnected with the river Krathis, a circumstance also shown by the fact that this class of symbolical river representations were not unicornic but purely bovine with respect to the head, such as that of the Achilles, one of whose horns was broken off in his contest with Heracles. 90. 15. The demi-unicorn bull alone, and also the heads of the lion and unicorn bull fronting each other, as if combatant, appear on coins of Kipros. Archaic coins of Sardis also show the demi-lion and demi-bull, not unicorn bull, the same type, combatant. On another coin of Sardis the demi-unicorn bull appears alone.91. 16. Another Sardian coin shows the heads of the lion and unicorn bull adderst and joined at the neck a forefoot of each being added. This type, is almost certainly borrowed from Persia. At Persepolis the double unicorn bull capital appears, the bodies of the bulls being joined below the neck, and a forefoot of each being added. Point ninety-two. This is probably ornamentation as distinct from symbolism. 17. Unicornic monsters are also shown on Persian gems, cylinders, and sculptures. These creatures, however, are not lunar, but reproductions of the Akkadian and Assyrian evil spirits, Tiamat and her brood, who often attack the moon god. One of them has the griffin head, a feathered crest and neck, a bird's wings, a scorpion's tail, 93 and legs terminating in the claws of an eagle, 94. 18. A very interesting Assyrian or Babylonian cylinder given by Kreutzer 95 from Ker Porter and Gigniot, shows above in the center the supreme divinity, having the crescent moon and seven planets on his right hand. And the eight-rayed radiate sun on his left. Beneath the crescent stands the moon god armed, Alf Ein Unjefluugelt's Einhorn, Unicorn, Trey Tend. Ninety-six before him stands the figure of a votary, behind whom and beneath the divinity is the sacred tree, beyond which and beneath the sun is the figure of the sun god armed, and holding over the tree what is apparently a necklet. A cuneiform inscription accompanies. Here, again, we have a scene of cosmic harmony, divinity, sun god, and moon god, sun, moon, and planets, and the tree of life, which, 
being placed under the divinity, is apparently a symbol of him in his effects. The direct connection between the crescent moon and the unicorn appears very strikingly. The moon god stands upon the unicorn exactly in the same way as in other instances 97 he stands upon his crescent. 19. The Assyrian sculptures show many representations of unicornic animals, e.g. 1. A cernet serpent hunting wild bulls, about BC 884, Northwest Palace, Nimrud. Two bulls are represented, each with a single large horn. 2. Assyrian oxen, Koyunjik. 98. 3. The ibex or gazelle. Point 99. 4. The familiar representation of a small fallow deer, carried by a branch bearing divinity. This treatment is apparently partly conventional, but I do not think with Sir G. Wilkinson 100 that the sculptors represented under the form of the unicorn bull the rhinoceros of which they had only heard, since widely different animals are so portrayed. Some representations show the two horns of the ibex. XX. A cylinder, found on the site of Nineveh, 101 shows above the emblem of divinity, sun, crescent moon, and seven planets, as in No. 18. Below, a man on horseback is apparently pursuing a unicorn antelope, in attitude almost rampant and regardant. Beyond this, another unicorn, also regardant, is standing suckling a young kid. A human figure, apparently a priest, stands before a trident and another emblem. The combination is evidently symbolical, but its signification is obscure. The regardant attitude of the unicorns is very noticeable. 21. Amongst miscellaneous Assyrian unicornic representations may be noticed. 1. A most heraldic pair of unicorns' heads on a clay tablet. 102. 2. The head of a unicorn bull at the end of a chariot pole, on which are also carved two winged unicorn bulls respectant. 103. 3. A unicorn ibex above a lotus flower, from the royal cylinder of Sennacherib. 22. Dan Carville 104 and Taylor the editor of Comet's Dictionary of the Bible, 105 give the following unicornic coin types, said to be Mardian, 106. 1. A coin from Hunter's Collection. A composite animal with one horn, a bull's body and legs, wings, and human head, upon which the modius, corn measure, a usual adjunct of Serapis, whose cult was introduced into Egypt from Sinope. 107 Reverend the Triquitra. Here for the first time we meet with this purely lunar emblem, i.e., three crescent moons issuing from the full moon, in connection with the unicorn. 2. Two unicorn bulls or bull and cow adders, after the type of the Persepolis capitals. Above, the Triquitra. Reverend the Triquitra. 3. Unicorn bull sinking down as if dying, above, a circle. The victory of sun over moon, or the waning moon. Reverend the Triquitra, variant phase as three legs. 108. 23. Lion pulling down a unicorn bull. 109 Chalcedony. Of this example, Mr. King remarks, the technique of this intaglio is altogether Assyrian, and the subject justifies the conclusion that it is of Phoenician workmanship. 24. The conjoined forequarters of two winged, unicorn dash, bulls, 110 Mr. King adds, probably to be understood as an astrological talisman, elusive to the sign Taurus. Sard Scarabaeus. The zodiacal Taurus, however, is not unicornic, and the type is the same as that of the Persepolitan capitals, which are certainly not zodiacal. It is singular how rarely those who reproduce these representations have noticed their unicornic character. XXV, the coins of Samos show a very interesting type, a lion's scalp, lion's head, or lion's head with open mouth. Rev. Of the first type, demi-unicorn bull. At Samos was a shrine of Dionysus Kachinos, 111, the Gaper, a solar divinity like the Apollon Kachinos of Elis, 112 the open-mouthed lion being a type of the raging, devouring sun, Athamas. 113 The coin type thus represented day and night, the lion and the unicorn, or the sun and moon. XXVI The unicorn bull, in one instance regardant, appears also upon some Creighton coins. 
The circumstance of a single horn, as shown on various coins, perplexed the learned metalist Pellerin, who remarked it, without being able to offer any explanation of it. 114 Creighton coins show various Semitic types, e.g. L'arbre cosmique, identique à l'arbre de vie. 115. XXV on the cup of Kurian 116 in Kipros are shown, amongst other devices, two unicorn goats, each standing on one side of some conventional object, and with one forefoot resting upon it. The twisted horn in each case is near the tree, whose type is well reproduced at the present time by the trees in Toy Noah's Arks. Atenei the unicorn also occurs in early, Egyptian, paintings, but, according to Sir G. Wilkinson, the Egyptian unicorn, even in the early time of the 12th dynasty, was the rhinoceros. 117 Yet at the same time we find a unicorn antelope depicted, 118 the animal couchant, the horn long and straight, and the tail standing straight up in an unnatural manner, in exactly the same way as the tail of the Kamek griffin is represented. 119 An additional circumstance in illustration of the fact that the representation is symbolical. The sound of the unicorn ideograph is given as, esti, typhon, and that of the griffin as, baru, bal, set, typhon. Now, set ou sautek personify l ardeur et la force redoutable du soleil, griffin. But as the, mertrier d'Osiris, il est le dieu du mal et personify les tenebres, 120 and may thus be connected with the nocturnal unicorn. Sir G. Wilkinson observes, many animals are introduced in the sculptures. Some of which are purely the offspring of disordered imagination, and the winged quadrupeds, sphinxes, or lions, with the head of a hawk or of a snake, and some others equally fanciful and unnatural, can only be compared to the creations of heraldry. 121 8 Disordered imagination should be the last thing appealed to in explanation of such creations. In the abstract, the same explanation might be given of the forms of the gods, and it is much more probable to suppose that some reason, symbolical or otherwise, underlies the efforts of the artist. 29. The discoveries of Schliemann at Mykin have revealed, as might be expected, several instances of the unicorn although the author does not notice any of them in this aspect. Thus on a gem 122 is shown the familiar unicorn cow or ox, in duplicate, as usual regardant, and each with a calf, but, as has sometimes been remarked on similar representations, no udder is shown. 123 The design is evidently symbolical, though it is by no means improbable that by the time it got as far west as Mykene the original meaning was forgotten or unknown. But we have already met on Assyrian ground 124 with the peculiar type of two unicorns standing opposite each other with reverted heads, and the circumstance is a link between the art of Mykene and that of the non-Aryan East. We must, in accordance with previous interpretation, regard the two calves as representing the new moon and the full moon, which draw their strength from the decreasing and increasing crescent moon. The animal being represented as male in accordance with the sex of the moon god. Triple X. Another remarkable gold ornament is described by Schliemann as, two stags lying down, with long three-branched horns, leaning with the necks against each other, and turning the head in opposite directions, like the Assyrian unicorn goats in No. 3, but so that the horns of both touch each other, and seem intended to form a sort of crown. 125 Here again the peculiar design shows a unity of origin, although very likely the maker of the Mycenaean example had no thought of lunar symbolism. The stags are small spotted fallow deer, and each has but one horn, in which are three tines, in fact, the treatment of the horn is precisely similar to that of the same animal in Assyrian representations. 126 The eye, too, is very prominent. 127. 31. Another example given by Schliemann 128 shows two spotted, couchant, bull-like, prominent-eyed unicorns, the horn in each case being treated exactly as in the last example, their necks touching. But the head of each reverted in the usual special manner. XXXII The next example from Schliemann 129 shows a queer-looking animal with the head of an ass, and bears paws, and one long horn with several tines. It is described as, a stag, 
of an alloy of silver and lead. 33. Lion and Unicorn Fighting. 130. The above instances by no means exhaust the appearances of the unicorn in archaic art, and at the same time show that the idea of such a creature was familiar in Babylonia, Assyria, Egypt, Asia Minor and Greece. Many points in the representations will become more suggestive in the course of the inquiry, meanwhile it may be noticed as a general result that i. the monster unicorn is not lunar. 2. the bovine unicorn is more or less lunar. 3. the unicorn antelope, except perhaps in Egypt, and the unicorn goat, are distinctly and essentially lunar. 4. the unicorn is very frequently represented as attacking or attacked by the lion. Inman remarks that the bull, whose frequent unicornic character he does not observe, and the lion, amongst the Assyrians, occupied much the same place as the lion and the unicorn do in modern heraldry 131. Section 4. Deus Lunis. The moon power, owing to the influence of the Greek Artemis Selene, the Latin Diana Luna, is generally feminine in our thoughts, but this aspect, though also occasionally occurring elsewhere, e.g. In Peru, is really exceptional. Thus among the Germanic nations the moon is masculine and the sun feminine. It is the daughter of Sol, the Norse sun goddess, who in the regenerated world shall ride on her mother's track when the gods are dead. 132 And it is the god Mani 133 who at Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods, shall be devoured by the wolf of darkness, Managarm, moon swallower, a reduplication of the terrible wolf Fenrir. 134. In Egypt again, Chans is the personification of the moon, and in this character he is called Kansa or Chans the moon. His name seems to mean, the chaser, or, pursuer, 135 the unicorn who, as we shall see, 136 chases the lion sun. Another Kamak lunar personage is Teddy, the Thoth, the weighing and measuring god, lord of knowledge and writing. 137, the crescent is found followed by the figure of Thoth in several hieroglyphic legends, with the phonetic name of. 138. The Arabs to this day, consider the moon masculine, and not feminine. 139. In Sanskrit the most current names for the moon, such as Kandra, Soma, Indu, Vithu, are masculine. The names of the moon are frequently used in the sense of month, and these and other names for month retain the same gender. 140. In Asia Minor was widely established the cult of the moon god Men, 141 the Lunus of the Romans, who, to a great extent suppressed his ritual. The Babylonian and Assyrian moon god is Sin, 142 whose name probably appears in Sinai. The expression, from the origin of the god Sin, was used by the Assyrians to mark remote antiquity. Because as chaos preceded order, so night preceded day, and the enthronement of the moon as the night king marks the commencement of the annals of cosmic order. The Akkadian moon god, who corresponds with the Semitic sin, is Aku, the seated father, as chief supporter of cosmic order, styled, the maker of brightness, and Zuna, the lord of growth, and Edu, the measuring lord. 143 The Aids of Hesychios 144 Edu is the equivalent of the Assyrian Arku, month, Heb Yerek, and is expressed in archaic Babylonian by the ideograph equals the circle, solar or, lunar plus, 10 plus 10 plus 10, i.e., the 30 days of the month. Also stands for the moon god as the god 30. Amongst the Finns Kuu is, the male god of the moon, 145 and exactly corresponds with a Ku. It is singular to find also Kwa as a moon name in Central Africa. 146. Among the Mbokobis of South America, the moon is a man and the sun his wife. 147. Amongst the Mexicans, Metztli, the moon, was a hero. 148. According to an Australian legend, Mityan, the moon, was a native cat, male, who fell in love with someone else's wife, and was driven away to wander ever since. 149. The Kajas of the Himalaya say that the moon, male, falls monthly in love with his mother-in-law, who throws ashes in his face, whence his spots, 150. Are Vula, the Figian moon, is male. 151. 
The Yachts of Vancouver's Island regard the moon as husband and the sun as wife 152. In Japan, the moon god was worshipped under the form of a fox 153. The unicorn is represented as male, being maiden with respect to chastity point 154. Section 5. The Lunar Phases. The succession of apparent alterations in the form of the moon presents a phenomenon so remarkable as necessarily to have attracted the attention and careful observation of man from the earliest period. With the Greeks the phases were named. I, the new moon. Nemenia, which because in the same line or path with the sun, is called Synodos. Two, the young moon. Nea Selene. Time in the month, Protphasis, the first appearance. A slender crescent seen a short time after sunset. 3. The increasing crescent. Hexagonos, six angled, as having run one sixth of its course. 4. The half moon. Hematamos, cut in twain. 155 also called tetragonos, as having four equal angles in its circuit, one fourth th of which it has now passed. V. The increasing moon. Amphicurtos, curved, on each side. Also called trigonos, triangular, for were an equilateral triangle drawn from its starting point, the present position would be the apex, one-third rd of its course being now passed. 6. The full moon. Pansolinos. Also called dicomenia, the month divider. 7. The decreasing moon. Amphicurtos, trigonos. 8. The second half moon. Hematamos, etc. 9. The decreasing crescent. Menoades, crescent shaped, Laplanatus. X. The old moon. Ene Selene. Time in the month, escate faces, the last appearance. A slender crescent. The corresponding Latin names are I. The new moon. Novelunium, which being invisible is called Luna Silence, and the time styled Congresses come soul. 2. The young moon. Nova Luna. Period, Prima Facis. 3. The increasing crescent. Prima Sextilis Aspectus. 4. The half moon. Luna Dividua, Semiplena, Bisecta. Prima Quadratura. V. The increasing moon. Luna Gibba, the humpbacked moon. Luna in Triquetro. 6. The full moon. Plenilunium. Also oppositio, the moon being now opposite the sun, Luna Totalunis, Medius Menses. 7. The decreasing moon. Luna Gibba. 8. The second half moon. Luna Dividua, etc. Secunda Quadratura. Tx. The decreasing crescent. Corniculata, Falcata, Curvata in Cornua. X. The old moon. Ultima Facis. The epithets Menoades, Corniculata, and the like, apply to any crescent phase of the moon. During the first half of its course the moon is Selene Oxanamine, Luna Crescens, the waxing moon, during the last half, Selene Thanusa, Luna Decrescens, Senescens, the waning moon. As the crescent moon is nearest the sun, 156 so it is the crescent moon that is represented with the young sun in its arms, 157 and the crescent moon is also the mother of the old moon and of the full moon. This is shown in the east window of Herringfleet Church, Suffolk, 158 where the crescent surrounds the full invisible moon, in the circle of which is the face of an angel. The unicorn goat during the first half of its career bounds forward from the sun, at which and the earth it looks back, and hence is regardant. During the second half of its career it bounds back towards the sun, looking round to the point whence it has begun to return. Point 159. The lunar phases received the greatest attention from Babylonian and Akkadian observers. But we are not yet in a position to formulate results, as in the case of the classical languages. Every position and alteration was more or less portentous, the system of portents being founded on the triple basis of, 1, actual natural incident, 2, anthropomorphic analogy, or, 3, synchronous occurrence. The left horn and the right horn of the moon are both mentioned, 
but it is also described as having, like the unicorn, a single horn. Thus we read, Ina Rei B. Karnu 160 Lai Kairav. Owing to rain, the horn was not visible. 161 Another passage states, Venus is in the ascendant, and, is, on the horn of, 162 Professor Say supplies, the sun, rather, I think, the moon. Again, a dark cloud covered the horn. 163 Again, the moon and its horn like the stars is white. 164 The crescent moon is called Karunu, horned. Section 6. Hecate. With the lunar phases is closely connected the mysterious goddess, Hecate, the far-shooting, whose Aryan name, like the epithets Hecatos, Hecatebolos, Telephos, Telephasa, etc. Describes the far-reaching action of the solar or lunar rays. 165 Unmentioned in the Homeric poems, she appears before us in the pages of Hesiod 166 as an august figure, daughter of Perses 167 and Asteria, the star-lighted splendor of space. Honored above all by Zeus and the other gods although a titanic being of a race earlier than the completed pantheon of Olympos. Soul begotten, a survival of the fittest, endowed with a triple dominion in earth, sea, and heaven, she sits in the seat of judgment beside kings, crowns whom she will with victory in war and in the games, grants wealth and honor. Is patron of riders and mariners, and is generally Caratrophos, a nursing mother. This remarkable personage, whose character seems more complicated than that of an ordinary Aryan divinity, and who receives the utmost respect from the race of Zeus to which she does not belong, presents a striking analogy with the august moon god of the Euphrates Valley, soul begotten, amongst the stars that have a different birth, wise and ancient ruler of the sea, connected with growth, with the horse, and, as we shall see, with the unicorn, and in some way or other of a triple character. Hesiod gives her dominion in earth, sea, and heaven, whilst others give her sway in heaven, earth, and underworld. True she has received an Aryan name, and in accordance with the lunar feelings of the Greeks, is represented as a goddess. But these circumstances are by no means conclusive on the question of her origin. I am unable, however, to pursue the inquiry here, suffice it to draw attention to the parallel. The cult of the goddess appears to have entered Greece from the direction of Thrake. 168. The very important element of triplicity is a remarkable link between the Euphradian moon god, Hecate 169 and the unicorn. The moon god Sin, as we have seen, 170 is represented by the three tens from the natural circumstance that his course was completed in about thirty days. This is one aspect of his triplicity, and tends to bring his trigonic phase into greater prominence. But he was also regarded by the Babylonians as having a threefold movement, one in longitude, one in latitude, and one in an orbit, 171 and here is a second aspect of triplicity. But ere men calculated the course of the moon, or considered its real or supposed different movements, they observed the orb itself and noticed its three phases or forms, crescent moon, half moon, and full moon. Come Tribus Pingebater, Phasebus, in Quit Cleomedes, Chia Vetter's Trace in Luna Figura's Observabant, by Cornus Silicet Luni, Medi et Pliny. 172 in the Argonautica, 173 a poem of late date, but to which in common with numerous other apocryphal productions the name of Orpheus 174 has been attached, Hecate Triformis appears as horse, dog, and snake. Sir G. W. Cox connects the horse with the full moon, the snake with the waxing moon, and the dog with the waning moon, but, whilst this connection is anything but obvious, another view of these phases will I think be admitted to be the correct one. And here let me call special attention to one of the most venerable relics in England, a drawing of a portion of which forms the frontispiece of this monograph, namely, the ivory horn of Ulf now in the vestry of York Minster. An inscription in Latin upon the horn states that Ulfus, prince of the western parts of Dara, originally gave it to the Church of St. Peter, together with all his lands and revenues. Camden, in his Britannia, mentions this horn, and quotes an ancient authority for an account of the donation of which it served as a token. The church holds by this horn several estates of great value, not far eastward from the city of York, and which are still called Terai Ulfi. 
175 and now upon this famous horn we find both Hecate Triformis and the unicorn. The horned horse is palpably the crescent moon, the snake or serpent is the emblem of the rays of light from the full moon, the Gorgo Medusa, 176 and the dog, whose head and neck only appear, represents the half moon. The dog may be also connected with the new or invisible moon. Pausanias says that, the Colophonians sacrifice a black whelp to Enodios, 177 i.e., Hecate, as goddess of crossroads. The unicorn of Ulf has the prominent eye before noticed in unicornic representations, 178 and which refers to the increasing moon soon to be full. The horn, it will be observed, is fast in the sacred tree, 179 and this feature of the myth I shall have occasion subsequently 180 to notice particularly. Suffice it to remind the reader here that dark groves were sometimes sacred to Hecate, as e. g. near Lake Avernus in Lower Italy. 181 black female lambs were also offered to the goddess. 182. It is evident that this triple moon phase, unicorn horse, serpent and dog, familiar alike to the artist of the horn and to the writer of the Argonautica, not to mention others, is of a high antiquity. Hecate has a triple power in Hesiod, the Euphradian moon god is equally connected with triplicity. 183 But the chief point in the present investigation is that the unicorn, whom we have seen in Babylonian art in the closest connection with the lunar power, is shown by this venerable horn to be beyond all contradiction the undoubted emblem of the crescent moon. Elsewhere I have observed, Hellenic divinities whose shapes are grotesque, monstrous or unhuman, are invariably not indigenous. Apparent exceptions to this canon, such, for instance, as the horse-headed Demeter of Figalia, or the Arcadian Pan, on careful examination, serve only to confirm it. 184 After noticing the four-faced Carthaginian Baal, the solar time king in his four changing seasons, I remarked. In the Karamaikos, at a place where three ways met, stood a four-headed Dionysiac statue, the work of the sculptor Telesarchides. It has been frequently said that Hecate and Hermes derive their occasional triplicity, and other unanthropomorphic adjuncts, from presiding over places where three roads met and the like. But although in later times these ideas were to some extent connected, and though the statue of a trichophallic or tetracophallic divinity might indeed with much propriety be erected where three or four roads met, yet the previous supposed character of the personage would occasion the act, the idea of many heads would not spring from that of crossroads. That the heads in origin were quite independent of the roads, is well shown in the instances before us, in which a four-headed god presided where three ways met. 185 Other epithets of Hecate, such as Triaditis, 186 Triceps, Tergeminus, Trivia, etc., require no further remark. And with the degradation of the goddess, the process by which she at length becomes a demon which, culminating in the Shakespearean Hecate, I am not here concerned, nor in the present investigation can I refer further to the moon dog. Section 7. Medusa the Gorgo. From the triple moon and the unicorn horse moon I pass on to the serpentine full moon, the victim of the solar Perseus, another version of the oft-recurring story. Careful study of the Homeric poems reveals the intrinsically archaic nature and high antiquity of the majority of their ideas, and in the consideration of any mythic personage a passage in Homer, if available, almost always supplies an excellent starting point. It is generally, but not quite accurately stated that, Homer knows only one Gorgo. The passages are as follows. On it, the Aegis of Athene, was a Gorgian head of a dreadful portent, 187. Hector, having the eyes of a Gorgo. 188. An awful-looking Gorgo, 189 was the device upon the shield of Agamemnon. Odysseus fears lest Persephonia from Hades should send a Gorgian head of a dreadful portent, 190. From these passages we gather. 1. That whilst there was certainly one Gorgo, there may also have been others. 2 that its eye constituted the chief terror of the appearance. Point 191. 3. That this appearance, originally portentous, 192 became, or was considered to be, monstrous. 193. 
For, that, though having a bright eye, it is connected with darkness and the underworld. And. 5. Was used heraldically as arms upon a shield. Fick would connect the obscure word Gorgo with the European root garg, to cry, and compares the sk. Garge, to emit a deep sound, 194 But the idea of sound is so truly out of place in the myth, a circumstance which we are bound to consider, that I am compelled to reject this derivation. I had deemed the term as possibly an intensive variant of orge, natural impulse, primarily, swelling, first physics, then metaphysics, as applied to the swollen, full-faced moon. For from Homer alone it is not very difficult to gather that Gorgo equals Luna. But the detail of a myth is the true test by which to try various etymologies of the name of its protagonist, especially when in the abstract several distinct derivations appear to have an almost equal claim to acceptance. Now the Gorgon power, as will more fully appear, equals nocturnal darkness plus moon, not darkness merely or the moon merely. Darkness, it will be remembered, is frequently, like chaos, depicted in monstrous form. But especially is it a devourer or swallower. 195 The Proto-Aryan root gar, to swallow, gulp, appears in the intensive form gar gar, 196 the Greek variant of which would be gorgo, the earliest form of the word in that language. Gorgo is the swallower, the devouring darkness which has a bright head, the moon, a head capable of being cut off. Hence the combined beauty and horror, hideousness, of the Gorgo, a hideousness which does not arise in the first instance from the lunar serpent rays, and hence the open mouth, so marked a feature in the Gorgonian and one not in the least lunar. Mr. Dennis observes. The most remarkable type on the coins of Populonia is the Gorgonian. Not here, the head of the fair-cheeked Medusa, 197. A woman's countenance with serpent locks. As it is represented by the sculptors of later Greece and of Etruria. But a monstrous fiend-like visage, with snaky hair, gnashing tusks, and tongue lolling out of. The open mouth that seemed to contain. A good full peck within the utmost brim. Appearing like the mouth of Orcus greasily grim. 198. From this open mouth issue two huge curved teeth, the lunar horns. The protruded tongue and gnashing teeth were familiar to the author, probably Hesiod 199, of the Aspis Heraclius. 200 And this leads us to the Hesiodic phase of the myth, according to which 201 there are three gorgons, equals Hecate Triformis, Medusa, the ruler, equals the king or queen moon, Stheno or Stheno, the strong, equals the general nocturnal potency. And Euryale the wide wandering, equals the moon, wandering companionless 202, a phase which corresponds with the solar Bellerophon in the same alien field. 203 do not hastily charge the intricate myth with inconsistency. The night is dark and not dark, lunar and not lunar, and so is the Gorgo, so are the Gorgones. And that the Gorgo is one as well as three, is shown clearly by a writer as late as Euripides. 204 The home of the Gorgones lies as of course in or beyond the western darkness. 205 With the Euemerism which first connected them with Libby 206 as a western region, and has subsequently identified them with apes of some kind, gorilla or orangutan, I am not here concerned. An early vase shows the solar Heracles, who for the purpose is the equivalent of the solar Perseus, killing the threefold Gorgon. 207. As Hecate is Perseus or Persea 208 and daughter of Perses, so Hecatos is Perseus, the solar hero, son of Zeus, heaven, in the form of a gleaming golden shower, and his son Perses is the mythic sire of the Persians. The Lords of the Sunstricken Plains, 209 of the East. 210 Perseus naturally engages to attack the Gorgo as the lion the unicorn, and assisted by Athene, the dawnlight, and Hermes, the wind power upon the clouds 211, sets forth upon the perilous expedition. The helmet of Hades, the unseen, renders him invisible, i.e. the condition of the nocturnal sun as concealed in the underworld. And from the two Gryi 212 he seizes the solar eye 213 and lunar tooth, 214 which he will not restore until they tell him where to find the implements necessary to complete his task. 
This eye and tooth the sisters are wont to hand from one to the other, i.e. from morn to eve, from eve to morn. The hero having obtained the other requisites, Hermes added the knife, harp, with which he had cut off the head of Argos. 2.15 And this same potency which put out the starry eyes, now puts out the lunar eye, or, to change the imagery, cuts off the bright head of the dark Gorgo, but the light veiled for a moment, soon reappears on the aegis of the Dawn Queen. The sun has done the deed, technically called the Gorgotomy, but he has to fly, pursued by Euryale, the reappearing moon, and Stheno, whom Sir G. W. Cox well describes as, the eternal abyss of darkness. 2.16 The petrifying stare of Medusa is the moon glare on the darkness when the color, sound, and motion of the world of day have gone. This myth alone might well form the subject of a monograph, but I can, here only notice one other of its many incidents, the weapon of Perseus, the harp, in shape a sickle or cymbal. Now the tradition that this was the special weapon used on the occasion, is a very ancient one, for Fairkides, B.C. 540, who according to the concurrent testimony of antiquity was the teacher of Pythagoras, and did not receive instruction from any master but obtained his knowledge from the secret books of the Phoenicians. 217 expressly names it as used by Perseus in the Gorgotomy. 218 It is the same, portentous sickle, Pi Epsilon Lambda Rho Iota Omicron Nu Rho Pi Eta Nu, which Kronos took in his right hand when he assailed Auranus, 219 for one of his peculiar adjuncts is the crescent-shaped sickle, which he somewhat singularly holds over his head in a scene where he is receiving from Rhea the stone supposed to be Zeus. 220 Lastly, we find that, the cymbal with which Meridak, or Bell, is armed, when about to fight with the dragon, is shown by the cylinders and bar leaves to have been of the shape of a sickle. And is therefore, as had also occurred to me, the same as the harp or kareb with which the hero Perseus was armed. 221 Now Bel and Meridak fight against chaos and also against darkness, and the chief weapon of the god who maintains nocturnal cosmic order is, as of course, the sickle-shaped moon. Perseus, in accordance with the principle of reduplication above noticed, armed with the crescent moon cuts off the gorgo head or full moon, just as another mighty Babylonio Akkadian divinity is described as being armed with the sun. 222 It is evident therefore that Perseus, who was supposed to have slain the sea monster at Joppa, and who in a passage of Herodotus, difficult to explain, is said to have had a temple and ritual in Egypt. 223 was more or less connected with the non Aryan East. Lenormand 224 gives an extract from a Babylonian fragment of which he says, Say le prototype de l'histoire de Percy et d'Andromede. And he thinks that Perseus may be another variant form of the word represented by the Persudos of Tejas, and is therefore in origin a Babylonian name. Very likely. But I do not doubt that it is also an Aryan name, that is to say, here probably, as in many other instances, an Aryan and a non-Aryan name, of somewhat similar sound, have become united like a double star. The sire of Andromede, 225 Kephius the Aethiop king and son of Belos, 226 is a personage altogether non-Aryan and Euphradian, and Hellenikos, B.C. 490-10, chief of the Greek logographers, mentions Kephius and the Cephenians, Ethiopians or Cushites, in connection with Babylon. 227. Lastly, in the dread Gorgo, originally darkness plus moon, then more distinctly lunar, we have the origin of the myth of the face in the moon. We know otherwise that this myth was archaic, for Epigenes of Sicyon, the most ancient writer of tragedy, 228 in a lost work called The Poetry of Orpheus, says that the theologer called the moon Gorgonian on account of the face in it. 229 and Serapion, an Alexandrian physician of the 3rd century BC, thought that, the face seen in the moon is the soul of the Sibylla. 230 According to the doctrine set forth by Plutarch, 231 evil souls, on attempting to enter the tranquil lunar region, are driven away by the dread face in the orb. 232. With respect to Gorgonian art, Sir G. Wilkinson is of opinion that, the monster Medusa evidently derived its form from the common Typhonian figure of Egypt, 233 nm. Claremont Gano, in a most interesting work, 
has elaborated a theory which connects a beautiful female gorgon with Hathor and Tanit, and a hideous male gorgon with the Kamek Bess.234. Speaking of Etruscan temple tombs, Mr. Dennis observes, the pediments terminate on each side in a volute, within which is a grim, grinning face, with prominent teeth, a gorgon's head, a common sepulchral decoration. 235 on the hollowed bottom of the famous Etruscan bronze lamp in the Museum of Cortona is, a huge gorgon's face, all horror. The visage of a fiend, with eyes starting from their sockets, a mouth stretched to its utmost, with gnashing tusks, and the whole rendered more terrible by a wreath of serpents bristling around it. 236 Well may Mr. Dennis add, it is a libel on the fair face of Dien, to say that this hideous visage symbolizes the moon. This difficulty I have fully explained. On the ceiling of a chamber in the cemetery of Perugia is, an enormous gorgon's head, hewn from the dark rock, with eyes upturned in horror, gleaming from the gloom, teeth bristling whitely in the open mouth, wings on the temples. And snakes nodded over the brow. 237 The Etruscans evidently fully shared in the Akkadian horror of darkness. On the back of the late Mr. Cooper's edition of Lenormand's Chaldean magic is represented, I presume from some Chaldean original, a Gorgonian, apparently a black face, radiate, with wide and open grinning mouth. This presents a remarkable combination of moon and darkness. Greek vases were occasionally molded in the shape of the leg of Gorgo. 238A vase in the British Museum 239 shows a Gorgo in connection with lions. She holds upon either side a lion by the forepaw. The lion standing on their hind legs, fling back their heads. The design may of course be mere sportive art, but it appears to be Assyrian in origin 240 and may signify the Gorgonian knight stationed harmoniously between two leonine days. Another vase 241 shows Perseus, wearing the pedicis and Teleria, plunging the harp, which he holds in his right hand, into the neck of the Gorgo, who has four wings, two snakes on each side of her head, and two round her waist. Her face has the usual gorgon type, with curls symmetrically ranged, an Assyrian characteristic, and a wide, open mouth showing the teeth and tongue. Another vase 242 shows the rare design of Perseus flying over the Libyan mountains, pursued by Steno and Euryale. The wild pursuit of the immortal gorgons seems to be the chase of darkness after the bright sun who, with his golden sandals, just escapes their grasp as he soars into the peaceful morning sky. 243. In Canon Spano's very interesting work, Nemosin Sarda Osia Recordi e Memori di Verii Monumenti Antici con Altra Rarita del I Sola de Sardegna, Colliery, 1864, several good examples of the Gorgon type are given. The most remarkable of which shows three Gorgon faces radiate, with open mouths and protruded tongues, in a circle, the lunar orb. Here the three Gorgon sisters are connected with the one moon. Section 8. Eno and Melikertz. I end the myth of Eno and Melikertz we see no longer opposition between day and night, sun and moon, but cosmic harmony, the crescent moon goddess with the young sun in her arms. Eno, the daughter of Cadmos the Easterner, 244 is married to Athamas, in Ionic Tamas, 245 the Phoenician Tammuz, 246 the Akkadian Demuzi, the only son, i.e., the solitary sun god, Melkarth, who goes forth to hunt alone. 247 by him she becomes the mother of Melikertz, the Phoenician Melkarth, or, city king, his reduplication, the son of the next day. And when the raging Athamas, Heracles Menominos, in madness slays his eldest child by Eno, the latter with the infant Melikertz, leaps into the sea, and is subsequently known as Lukathi, the white goddess. The obscure name Eno is probably a variant of Yuno, Juno, and from being a phase of here, the gleaming heaven, she becomes the queen of heaven, Labana, the pale shiner, the white moon goddess, the horned Astarte. And as such she assists the storm-tossed Odysseus with her headband, Credemnon, Moon scarf of the lunar rays. 248 Such is Eno with beautiful ankle, the moon walking in brightness, whose kindly unicorn horn drives away noxious things. The fostering mother who, like a Juno Matuta, nurtures the young sun god Dionysus, 
who is identical with Melkarth, Melek, Molek, after the death of his own mother Semela, 249 he being the chief of, the precious things put forth by the moon. Not far from the Phoenician settlement in Kithira 250 was a temple and oracle of Eno. They prophesy when asleep, since the goddess answers those who consult her by dreams. Water, pleasant to drink, flows from a sacred fount, and they call it the fount of the moon. 251 According to an M.S. Neoplatonic commentary of Olympiodoros on the Phaedon, Eno is water, being marine. Here is a preservation of a faint shadow of the truth, for the connection between the moon and water is obvious. But the theory of Olympiodoros that the four daughters of Cadmos represent the four, so-called, elements, may be paralleled with the modern view of Rawl, 252 that they represent the four stages of intoxication. 253 The leap of Eno with the child into the sea was localized at the rock Maliris near Megara. 254 whence Melikertz was said to have been carried on a dolphin, like Apollon Delphinios, the fish son, to Corinth. Here he had a curious labyrinthine shrine. 255. Section 9. The Three-Legged Ass of the Bundahis. The next phase of the unicorn is, I think, a novel one, and will solve a previously felt difficulty. In the Pallavi 256 work, the Bundahish or Bundahis, 257 is a circumstantial account of a wonderful animal called the three-legged ass, which, according to M. Dharmasteter, 258 is a personification of cloud, storm, etc. But whilst this hypothesis can never be demonstrated, I think on a review of the evidence the contrary will clearly appear. The writer states. Regarding the three-legged ass they say, that it stands amid the wide-formed ocean, and its feet are three, eyes six, mouths nine, ears two and horn one, body white, food spiritual, and it is righteous. 259. This puzzle to commentators now at once becomes luminous. The triform, triquetric moon stands amid the wide oversea of heaven, the mare magnum sign fine, and its feet are three. To what other personage or phenomenon would this apply? To attempt to explain every detail in the late and elaborated, and possibly in part purely arbitrary, account would be very unsafe. Suffice it if the main outline comes out quite clearly. The ass, a wise and sagacious animal, especially in Eastern Idea, 260 has six eyes or two for each of the three phases, the horse serpent dog moon has six eyes. There is some doubt about the word translated, mouths. It may mean, testes, and, if so, would connect the moon as usual with fertility and increase. The two ears may be the two ends of the horn, which is that of the lunar unicorn. Its body is of course white, lookethy. From the archaic time of the Babylonian moon god Sin, it is righteous, nay, the leader of righteousness and of cosmic order, and as a righteous and heavenly being its food, if it have any, must be, spiritual. The description continues. And two of its six eyes are in the position of eyes, i.e., in the full face or serpent moon, two on the top of the head, on the dog moon, the half, or new moon, and two in the position of the hump, i.e. in the unicorn horse, the crescent or gibbous moon. With the sharpness of these six eyes it overcomes and destroys, 261 i.e., the dread lunar face and lunar eye which, as we have seen, drives away evil and scares wicked souls. The eye is the chief power of the ass, as it is of the gorgo. The whole extraordinary description is, on analysis, most palpably lunar. Of the nine mouths three are in the head, three in the hump, and three in the inner part of the flanks. 262 The mouths are distributed amongst the phases in the same manner as the eyes. The hump, so far as any actual animal supplies the imagery, will be that of the Indian ox. The increased number may express intensity, and the mouths be more or less gorgonian. The one horn is as it were of gold and hollow. With that horn it will vanquish and dissipate all the vile corruption due to the efforts of noxious creatures. 263 This is the pure bright unicorn's horn that drives away darkness and evil, cleanses streams and pools, and by which, venom is defended. 264. When it stales in the ocean all the seawater will become purified. If, O oh three-legged ass! 
You were not created for the water, all the water in the sea would have perished, 265 The CN Water Ruling Moon Tistar seizes the water more completely from the ocean with the assistance of the three-legged ass. 266 In Bundahis, 7. 2. We read. Every single month is the owner of one constellation. The month Tyr is the fourth month of the year, Cancer 267 the fourth constellation from Aries, so it is the owner of Cancer, into which Tistar sprang, and displayed the characteristics of a producer of rain. Tistar, Tistria or Tistria, is Sirius, 268 who, as the stellar protagonist, cooperates with the moon in ruling water and regulating that humidity which is necessary to vitality. Tistar was converted into three forms, the form of a man and the form of a horse and the form of a bull, thirty days and nights he was distinguished in brilliance, and in each form he produced rain ten days and nights. As the astrologers say that every constellation has three forms. 269. In this very interesting passage we see the triform moon reduplicated in a triform Sirius, himself in his glorious light a second moon. His special period of brilliance is that of the lunar course, and like the moon, he takes the forms of horse and bull. 270. When we get as late as the formulated systems of the astrologers, each zodiacal constellation has three forms as divided into three decans, and it appears that the extra zodiacal constellations were also regarded in some way as triform. These are the elaborations of previous simpler observation, and probably originally based upon lunar triformity. Thus, to star the shining, majestic, the first ten nights unites himself with a body with the body of a youth of fifteen years, a shining one, with bright eyes. The second ten nights, Tistar unites himself with a body, proceeding along the clear space, with the body of a bull with golden hoofs. 271 The third ten nights Tistar unites himself with a body, with the body of a horse, a shining, beautiful one, with yellow ears, with a golden housing. 272 These phases, however, do not really apply to Sirius but to Lunus, and hence their origin. The three-legged lunar ass is found on coins and elsewhere under the familiar form of the Triquetra, 273 the origin of which appears thus. 274. It is familiar on coins of Sicily as the national monetary type, a connection however which is probably merely based upon the shape of the island, Trinacria or, as the Roman poets sometimes actually call it, Triquetra. But in the case of the Isle of Man no such reason can be admitted as explanatory. 275 Planch remarks. The arms of man are legs, or in less equivocal language, the ancient kingdom of man was, and the island itself is still, represented in heraldry by three legs in armor, conjoined at the thighs. Our example of this heraldic curiosity 276 is particularly interesting, because the armor in which the legs are encased is the banded mail of the 13th century. And therefore presents us with the earliest appearance of the armorial coat of that island and sovereignty, after it had ceased to be Norwegian, a. d. 1264. The origin of the bearing has yet to be discovered. 277 Behold it. On coins of the ancient Greek city of Metabon, Metapontum Metapontum, on the Tarentine Gulf, the three crescent legs appear in a variant phase thus. The dots show that the three crescents are really identical with the central dot or full moon. A favorite type on coins of Metabon is the ear of corn which is always, and doubtless justly, connected with local fertility and the cult of Damator series. But at the same time the resemblance between the ear and the sacred tree of the Euphrates Valley is very striking. Another coin of Metabon shows a bull's head, a type which may be lunar. 278. A triquetric ornament appears also at Troy and Mykene.279. Section 10. Aspects of the Moon. Light being pleasant to man and darkness more or less awful, the original aspect of the moon is a friendly and favorable one as the head of nocturnal cosmic order, the beneficent unicorn, the righteous ass of the Bundahis who is hated and warred against by the powers of evil. But the moon may be the friend as well as the enemy of night, and as such becomes Gorgonian and terrific, connected with witchcraft, 
evil demons, wicked apparitions, 280 and all the power and horror of great darkness. Whilst its changing form admits of monstrous concrete representation in art and fancy. With reference to the sun, the moon may with almost equal propriety appear as the sire, mother, brother, sister, husband, bride or nurse of the mighty star. Friendly to the sun, as Eno or Sin, hostile as the unicorn, pursued by or pursuing the sun. When civilization progresses sufficiently to possess a calendar, the moon, as time measurer, lends invaluable assistance, and marks the months. As lord of moisture and humidity, the moon is connected with growth and the nurturing power of the peaceful night. The moon too, like the sun, speaks of a future life, so that even the rude Congo Negro claps his hands and cries, so may I renew my life as thou art renewed. 281 And in the famous Namaqua myth, the moon once sent the hair to men to give this message, like as I die and rise to life again, so you also shall die and rise to life again. 282 According to the anthropomorphic principle the moon appears in male or female form, and is symbolically connected with the bull or cow, unicorn or horse, serpent, dog and cat. With the latter animal probably on account of phenomena of periodicity, cat's eyes shining in the dark, etc. 283 It is also at times a pearl or a good fairy. 284 Regarded as a locality, it often appears as the abode of departed souls. So in the Kamic Book of the Respirations, which is probably of the epoch of the Ptolemies, the wish is expressed respecting the deceased. That his soul may rise to heaven in the disk of the moon. 285. Such are some of the principal mythological lunar aspects. If the savage at times regards her as cleft in sunder by the angry sun, the poet at times also has his mere fancies, fancies as distinguished from the ordinary growths of mythology and compares her to a lunatic and dying lady. Tottering forth. Led by the insane. And feeble wanderings of her fading brain. 286. But in health we do not speak thus, and so to this same great singer in a nobler moment she is an orbed maiden with white fire, white gold, laden. More grandly did Milton see her, in his stately vision, throwing, her silver mantle o'er the dark, even as Homer and Tennyson saw. The stars about the moon. Look beautiful, when all the winds are laid. And every height comes out, and jutting peak. And valley, and the immeasurable heavens. Break open to their highest. I append two figures 287 illustrating the origin of the terms caput and cauda draconis as applied to the moon's nodes, knots, or the two points in the heavens where the moon's orbit intersects the plane of the ecliptic. The circling path of the sun becomes similarly the time serpent, camp, caterpillar, a monster slain by the solar Dionysus. 288. These two lunar serpents, twin crescents, the increasing and decreasing moon, and whose combination makes the full moon, are the two bulls which draw the moon car on its path through space. Section 11. The Contest Between the Lion and the Leopard. Eri noticing the final defeat of the nocturnal unicorn, let us examine a very remarkable and most interesting instance of the triumph of night over day. The solar Dionysus 289 Bakshos Melkarth, 290 as radiate is styled Kerosphoros, Torokeros, and the like, and in a solar aspect generally Antages, Chrysocombs, Chrysopes, Pyropo, etc. But one of his more occult epithets is Dithyreites, he of the two entrances. According to one legend the cave in which he was concealed by Zeus from his angry consort here, 291 had two entrances. 292 and this is perfectly correct, for the cave is the underworld. The two entrances are, the eastern gate where the great sun begins his state, 293 and that which in Kamic mythology is called, the gate of the west, the region of bliss. 294 These two most important gates or pylons are in the Kamic scheme guarded by Seb, the time-marking earth god who, lying on the surface of the earth and looking up into the vault of heaven, watches sun, moon and stars passing through his gateways, and in so doing mark solar, lunar and sidereal time. The sun god weighs our Osiris, suffering, triumphant, 
and in this phase in immediate relation with the individual human soul which in some occult manner must follow in his steps, the great soul, has come along the noble road, making his path above. 295 I. E. The solar track which, according to the Vedic poet, has been prepared for the sun by the highest gods, Mitra 296 and Varana 297, Aranas, and is, free from dust. 298 And at eventide he reaches and passes through the western gate, to reappear in due course through the eastern gate on the next morning. Such are the two horizon gates of Hades, the unseen underworld. The influence of mythology upon heraldry is a subject of great interest and one which yet remains for scientific treatment, and the following myth, faithfully preserved in the latter science, presents an admirable instance of the ever recurring contest between Astrochiton, Starry Night, and Dionysus Dithyreites. The heraldic leopard is a beast of unkindly procreation and double nature, being engendered between the lioness and the pardus or male panther, and is thus exorbitant of nature's general course and intendment. This misbegotten beast is naturally enemy to the lion, and finding his own defect of courage to encounter the lion in fair fight, he observeth when the lion makes his walk near to his den. Which, in policy, he hath purposely wrought spacious and wide in the double entrance thereof, and narrow in the midst, so as himself being much more slender than the lion, may easily pass. When he seeth the lion, he mocketh towards him hastily, as if he would bid him battel in the open fields. And when he seeth the lion prepared to encounter him, he betacketh him to his heels, and mocketh towards his den with all celerity, whom the lion eagerly pursueth with full course, dreaming of no danger by reason of the large entrance into the den. At length through the vehemency of his swift course, he becometh so straight Ned in the narrow passage in the midst of the den that he can go neither forwards nor backwards. The lion being thus distressed, his enemy passeth through his den, and cometh behind him, and gnaweth him to death. 299. This very singular and ancient account is evidently founded on some actual fact, but certainly on no fact connected with the habits of the animals. The simple interpretation of the occult legend is that the lion, type of the hunting, radiate, diurnal sun three hundred speeds across heaven towards his fate and death in the den of the two entrances, the nocturnal cave tenanted by the starry spotted leopard of night, and where the noble beast is caught whilst going down the dark passages 301 and perishes, although only to be reborn in triumph at the eastern gate. The two animals, as protagonists of night and day, are thus naturally hostile. There is a wide entrance to the underworld, Facilis de Census Averni. The darkness flies from the light, and the Vedic poet says that, the stars slink away, like thieves 302 from the presence of Surya, 303 even as the cowardly leopard of the myth betakes him to his heels. The noble Samus 304 pursues with all, the vehemency of his swift course, whilst his enemy passing through the den, appears in heaven behind the hidden sun, whom he thus slays. And, according to a wild beast simile, and one, moreover, applied to an ignoble beast, gnaws to death. Another phase of this spotted leopard is Argos Panoptes, the bright all-seeing one, who possessed a hundred eyes, and who was appointed by the jealous here guardian of the lunar, horned Io, the beloved of Zeus. Amongst other exploits Argos had slain in her sleep 305 the terrible, dracontic, black-eyed, maiden serpent, Echidna, 306, the strangler, whose dark folds were wrapped around the extinguished day. But who whilst in the heavy repose of profound gloom was suddenly annihilated by the myriad bright eyes of Tistar Sirios and his fellows. But Hermes, the wind power upon the clouds, the breeze of morning, 307 puts out the starry eyes and thus becomes Argifontes, the slayer of Argos, an ancient epithet familiar to Homer. On a gem, representing the myth, 308 Hermes, as in the case of Perseus the assistant of the diurnal power, has just decapitated Argos, an act the exact equivalent of the Gorgotomy, and his body covered with spots, the starry eyes, has fallen on the ground. Behind is the peacock, the bird of here, with its spotted, starry-eyed tail. As Mr. Ruskin notes, we know that this interpretation is right, from a passage in which Euripides describes the shield of Hippomedon, which bore for its sign Argus the All-Seeing, 
covered with eyes. Open towards the rising of the stars, and closed towards their setting. 309 The starry eyes of Argos become medievally the 11,000 virgins 310 who accompany S. Ursula, little bright one, i.e., the moon as opposed to the sun. Rickshaw Arctosursus, Ursa, dim. Ursula, in the sense of bright, has become the name of the bear, so called either from his bright eyes or from his brilliant tawny fur, suggests Professor Max Muller. 311 Be this as it may, the root arc, to be bright, is the sire of a whole tribe of words which have made myths, such as Arcas, Argo, Argos, Arjuni Arginis, etc. And in the story of the Arcadian nymph Callisto, changed into a she bear, we have precisely that same confusion of thought which in India converted the seven shiners, Arkshas, into seven sages, Rishis, and in the West changed them into bears. The root, in short, furnished a name for stars, bears, and poets alike. 312 As the moon is Ursa Ursula, so two famous constellations are Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. Thus in their cosmic signification spots denote the star-spangled heaven, Polos Uranios, and so of the fully attired Orphic worshipper we read. From above the head, the all variegated skin of a wild fawn. Thickly spotted should hang down from the right shoulder. A representation of the wondrously wrought stars and of the vault of heaven. 313. Such is the nocturnal peacock leopard, slayer of darkness, slain by mightier light. Section 12. The Lion and the Unicorn. Subsection 1. The Solar Lion. That the lion is a symbol of the sun, and more particularly of the diurnal sun, is a fact familiar to the mythologist, and one which has already been illustrated in the preceding pages, 314 but a few further instances may suitably here be added. In the Kamakim to Are Haramaku, 315 the diurnal sun on the horizon, we read. Thou roarest in smiting thy foes, 316 The terrible roaring of flame being a link between the sun and the lion, as an Akkadian hymn writer says of Nindara, Lord of the Darkness, i.e. The nocturnal sun, thou, during thy action, roarest, 317 And as a Vedic hymn writer says of Agni, Ignis, that he, roars like a lion, 318. In the inscription of Daryavashai. At El Karja, the oasis of Ammon in the Libyan desert, the great god Amenare, the invisible god revealed in the sun god, is addressed as the lion of the double lions. These two lions, two brothers, the two lion gods, are two solar phases as diurnal and nocturnal, Har and Set, 319 Shu and Tefnut, 320 and as there is but one solar orb, so he is the lion of the double lions. In the funereal ritual the Osirian, or soul seeking divine union and communion with the sun god, prays. Let me not be surpassed by the lion god. O, oh, the lion of the sun, who lifts his arm in the hill, 321, of heaven. And exclaims. I am the lions. I am the sun. The white lion is the phallus of the sun. 322. A remarkable amulet of the Hellenicocamic period, copied by Calus, 323 illustrates the occult expression, phallus of the sun, and also shows the solar leonine connection. In the center of a circle is a closed human eye, surrounded by various animals and representations all turned toward Esset, and placed in the following order, on the right hand or eastern side, a cock, a serpent, and a goose. On the north, a lizard and a thunderbolt, on the west, a scorpion and a phallus, and on the south, a lion and a dog. Calus remarks feebly that, superstition is infinitely varied in its details, but makes no attempt to explain the design. And indeed the combination is elaborate and extensive, and the design inexplicable when solely regarded either on Kamic or Hellenic principles. The single central eye is closed to show that the sun of the underworld is indicated, and the lion, type of the diurnal sun, is placed in the lower part of the design to show that the flaming sun of day has sunk beneath the horizon. By the Leonine sun, is his ally the raging dog star, Setsothis, Qon Sirios, Sirius, the scorching. Conversely, the lizard, emblem of the moisture and dews of night, and as such slain by the Hellenic sun god Apollon Soriktonos, 324 is placed in the north, 
that is in the height of the nocturnal heaven. The thunderbolt, which comes from the sky, also appears high in heaven. To the east, his head close on the horizon line, stands the cock, the solar bird of day. Immediately above him and due east is the serpent of light, a solar creature in Kamic symbolism and the creeping dawn gleam in Hellenic. Above the serpent is the goose volant, its neck stretched towards the sun and flying from east to west. It represents the soul of the Osirian which is said to, cackle like a goose, 325 to fly, and to, alight on the road of the west of the horizon, flying towards the sun god Wazar Osiris. Near the western horizon ready to seize the sinking sun is his scorpion daughter the darkness. 326 The phallus, placed below the horizon, illustrates the secret power of the sun in the renewal of the face of the world, and is winged in order to identify it with the solar orb. According to M. Paul Pierret, whose opinion on the matter I do not dispute, the Leontocephalic Kamic goddesses represent the power of the solar eyes. 327. The solar Dionysus, as Pater Bromius, the roarer, sometimes appears as Leontocephalic in Mithraic and Gnostic symbols. 328 And in the Bakchai of Euripides the chorus call upon him to put forth his dreadful might and to appear as a flaming lion, Pi Upsilon Ro Iotophi Lambda Gamma Omega Nu Lambda Omega Nu. 329. The river Nile was regarded as an emanation from the Cosmic sun god Osiris, 330 and hence is called by Homer Dipetes, 331, sky fallen, as descended from the solar lion. Hence the usual type of Leontocephalic fountain pipes, an idea which does not merely depend on the sun being in Leo at the time of the inundation, for the zodiacal Leo is not an archaic Kamic constellation. And still less on the alleged contemporaneous appearance of lions in the country. Mr. King mentions an Etruscan example which shows figures in regular Babylonian costume, worshipping before a fountain discharging itself out of a colossal lion's head into a basin, a palm tree in the midst. 332 Phipik is the name of an Etruscan lion-headed monster, with water flowing from his mouth. 333 He is said to have been combated by Heracles, perhaps as a rival sun god. The lion sun draws up the waters of the earth and sends them down again. The lion and sun form the familiar national standard of Persia, and a Persian coin given by Tavernier 334 shows the sun horned and radiate rising over the back of a lion. In the later period of the solar Mithras cult the superior officials were styled lions, hence the rites themselves are often designated as Leontica. 335. The Leontocephalic serpent radiate is a familiar design in Gnostic and other gems which form that large division classed by Montfaucon under the heading Abraxas. Sometimes seven stars, sometimes the sun and moon are in the field. The head often has seven rays. The lion is occasionally shown in full, one example 336 gives the eight-rayed solar star beneath him, and the crescent moon high in heaven. Another interesting example of the lion sun is shown on a gem 337 which represents the lion, over whom is the eight-rayed solar star, swallowing headfirst a large bee. The bee is a creature especially connected with the happy and peaceful earth life of growth and increase, and so finds a prominent place in the symbolism of the great nature goddess Artemis Ephesia Polymastos, whose chief priest was called Essen, the king bee. 338 The bee-swallowing lion is the raging athemus consuming the nourishing vegetation of the earth, whose happy voice is uplifted in the murmuring of innumerable bees. 339 the last instance of the connection between sun and lion which I shall mention is the zodiacal Leo, the Akkadio-Assyrian sign of the month Abu, Aramaic Ab, July-August, the Akkadian name of which is Ababgar, fire that makes fire. The period of the full sway of the burning Athamas Tammuz. I have treated of the original connection between the sun and the signs in a separate monograph.340. Subsection 2. The Contest. Such, then, being the characteristics of the mythological lion and unicorn, they are, like the lion and the leopard, naturally antagonistic, and their contest is the converse of that of these two latter animals. As the lion, fast in the cave, is gnawed to death by the leopard who comes round behind him, 
so the unicorn when rushing at the lion sticks his horn fast in a mythic tree behind which his opponent has taken refuge. And the lion coming round devours him whilst thus defenseless. This incident of the story, when taken in connection with the leopard myth, shows that no real animal has supplied a foundation for the belief. Spencer thus gives the legend. Like as a lion whose imperial power. A proud rebellious unicorn defies. Tavoid the rash assault and wrathful store. Of his fear's foe, him to a tree applies. And when him running in full course he spies. He slips aside. The wiles that furious beast. His precious home, sought of his enemies. Strikes in the stock, any thence can be released. But to the mighty victor yields a bounteous feast. 341. Malone, commenting on the passage, Unicorns may be betrayed with trees, 342 quotes Bussy Dambois, 1607. An angry unicorn in his full career. Charge with too swift a foot a jeweler. That watched him for the treasure of his brow. And ere he could get shelter of a tree. Nail him with his rich antler to the earth. On the passage, wert thou the unicorn, pride and wrath would confound thee, and make thine own self the conquest of thy fury, 343 Sir Thos. Hanmer quotes from Gessner, History of Animals, the unicorn and the lion being enemies by nature, as soon as the lion sees the unicorn he betakes himself to a tree, the unicorn in his fury, and with all the swiftness of his course, running at him. Sticks his horn fast in the tree, and then the lion falls upon him and kills him. Schliemann gives a representation of a gold plate from Mykeen with a design which he says, represents a lion chasing a stag, the four feet of the former are in a horizontal line to show the great speed with which he is running. He has just overtaken the stag, which sinks down before him, and his jaws are wide open to devour it. The representation of the stag which has no horns, is clumsy and indistinct. 344 This is not a correct description of the design. The so-called stag, half of which only is shown, has a head and neck like that of a horse, and a peculiar crest not unlike that with which the griffin is at times supplied. I rather think that it has also one short horn, and far from sinking down, or flying, as might be implied from Schliemann's description, it awaits the lion's charge with lowered head, and is apparently the larger animal of the two. I do not assert that the design represents the contest of lion and unicorn, but it certainly bears a great resemblance to this famous duel. The myth is of course very easy to explain in the light of the foregoing considerations. The lion sun flies from the rising unicorn moon and hides behind the tree or grove of the underworld, 345 the moon pursues and, sinking in her turn, is caught in this mysterious tree in sun slain. So, curiously enough, we read in a Babylonian astrological tablet, Sin Samsa 346 La 347 UCIVA, Na Under Arei 348 Uaki. 349 The moon the sun does not face, appearance of lions and hyenas. 350 So, again. The moon and sun with one another are seen, king to king hostility sends. 351 The sun in the place where the moon set is fixed. 352 So some families who bear the unicorn as arms or crest have such mottos as, Tenas Ledroit, Cassis Tatissima Virtus, etc. Moonlight as involving comparative cold and frigidity, not unnaturally connects the moon in idea with chastity. Subsection 3. The Grove of the Underworld. As the lion is caught in the straightness of a cave, so the unicorn is caught in a tree. And I will first briefly notice the mythic statements respecting this tree and its reduplication as a grove, and secondly consider the meaning of the occult myth. First, then, as to the tree myth, the tree constantly comes before us in connection with the unicorn in archaic art, 353 and in addition to the foregoing instances, I may mention a very remarkable gold signet ring found by Schliemann at Mykeen. 354 on which is shown the conventional tree, whose stem certainly resembles that of a palm. It has fifteen short branches on which we see no leaves, but large clusters of a small fruit, each cluster resembling a pine apple. One savant regards it as a pine, another as a breadfruit tree, 
another as a clumsy representation of a vine. But it is none of these, being merely the conventional tree of the myth, which in art has passed as far westwards as Mykene, and is often a palm, Euphradian type, or poplaresque, Kamic type, the two being found jointly under Phoenician influence. The types of the sacred tree of Assyria are now very familiar to us from the works of Assyriologists and otherwise, in some instances divinities stand or kneel on each side of it. A sacred tree, an ox, a bee, 355 were special Babylonian symbols. 356 Thus a Babylonian cylinder 357 gives, sacred tree, seated figure on each side, and serpent in background, a combination which links it with the biblical tree of life. 358 and an Assyrian cylinder 359 shows, sacred tree, or grove, with attendant cherubim. A Kamic representation 360 gives, the cypress 361 shades guarded by fire-breathing Uriai, the solar serpents of good. In these secure retreats the bodies of the just await their ultimate revivification. The symbolical trees are in each case trees of the country where the myth originated. Fairkides 362 of Cyrus, a writer of reputed Phoenician descent and whose works show the strongest Oriental influence, says, Zaz, Zeus, makes a veil large and beautiful, and works on it earth and Ogen, 363 and the palace of Ogen. 364 and this veil which is identical with the starry Peplos of Harmonia, the bride of Cadmos, the Easterner, i.e., the sun, 365 whose marriage with stellar space completes cosmic order, the god hangs on a winged oak, pi pi tau epsilon rho omicron delta rho, m. Mori well observes on the myth, c'est la evidement un image de la voûte du firmament, sovent figuri par un voil, e aquil un arbre est don pour support. Ilya la un conception tout semblable a celle de l'arbre Yggdrasil de la mythologie scandinave, don't les racines es attendant jusquo nivelheim et don't la tige es alive don les you. 366 At Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods, the conclusion of the present state of things, the gigantic cosmic ash tree Yggdrasil groans, trembles, and is set on fire. But a man and woman Lifthraiser, Life Razor, and Lif, Life, are preserved amid the general destruction in a sacred grove called Hodmamir's Holt, 367 which M. Dharmasteter calls the Vibwa Hodmamir equivalent Du Freen Yggdrasil, 368 a statement that is correct in a certain sense but not absolutely. Hadmamir signifies circle mimir or sphere mimir, that is to say, the physical mimir 369 or ocean like the Midgardsorm, great sea serpent, encircles the earth. And when the latter is consumed Lifthraser and Lif are safely conveyed across ocean to the far ocean grove, which we find in Homer. When thou hast sailed in the ship across the stream Okeanos, Hadmamir, where are groves of Persephonia, the queen of the underworld, poplars and willows. 370 Stesichoros, 371 BC. 632 to 552, tells how Helios, 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 Hyperion's son, i.e., son of the climbing sun of morning, like the Vedic Yama found out the way to the happy world which is in the west. And sailed in his golden boat cup, which he afterwards lent to his, dedoublement, Heracles, o'er ocean to see his dear ones in the sacred laurel 372 grove, and Mr. Ruskin, following Pindar, 373 tells us that the Greeks had sometimes a prophet to tell them of a land, where there is sun alike by day and alike by night, where they shall need no more to trouble the earth by strength of hands for daily bread. But the ocean breezes blow around the blessed islands, and golden flowers burn on their bright trees for evermore. 374 These abodes form the western garden of the Hesperides, where are the golden solar apples of life that resemble the fruit shown on the conventional tree, and were guarded in the unseen world by the monster serpent or dragon of darkness which, like the Norse Nidhogg, gnawing serpent, coils around the roots of the sacred tree. These sacred trees appear rudely marked on many of the worlds found by Diar. Schliemann on the site of Troy, 375 and the solar Dionysus as the renewer of the life and growth of the earth, is Dendrites, 376, Lord of the Tree, in accordance with the imagery of the Hebrew poet prophet. As the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. 
377 palm trees grew around the sacred square enclosure of Perseus at Chemi, in the Thebaic Canton, 378 and the circumstance connects this Perseus with the Semitic and Persian East. 379 The sacred grove with poplaresque trees appeared in reality within the Teminos of many Kamic temples. It is unnecessary to add further instances. The myth is not either specially Aryan or specially Semitic, and the tree represents the principle of life, whilst the whole cosmos is regarded as a mighty tree. But life is constantly being renewed from sources secret and invisible to us, especially from the underworld, which not only represents the fatness of the earth beneath, but is the highly mysterious cavern where the great solar light bringer and life stimulator perpetually returns. Hence, in this unknown region which the living tread not and where the sources of life are treasured up, there must by analogy be a tree, the earthly symbol of life, trees. A grove, a happy garden, a paradise, 380, where souls do couch on flowers, for man ends not at death, and in this tree the expiring crescent moon, caught by her horn, pales and dies before the sun as he goeth forth in his strength. All discord is harmony not understood, the apparent contest of nature is in reality but the tranquil course of nature. I keeping their eternal track. The deities of old. Went to and fro, and there and back. In boats of starry gold. 381. The sun is established forever, the moon is a faithful witness in heaven, the dragon darkness is trampled under the feet of light, 382 Nay, the scorpion of night, subdued to peacefulness, guards the hidden sun through the hours of gloom. And man, recognizing his covenant-keeping creator, thanks God and takes courage. For, as is the world without, so is the world within. And the storms and splendors of nature find apt parallels in the conflicts and glories of the soul, greatest of things created. 383 Individual circumstances, if either distinctly happy or the reverse, tend somewhat to confuse the mental vision. We can get but one view of a particular prospect from one place, and we can be but in one place at a time. Yet however we may bend and reel beneath the blast of circumstance, nay, may falter where we firmly trod, still, to use the noble words of a living sage. In health the mind is presently seen again, its overarching vault bright with galaxies of immutable lights, and the warm loves and fears that swept over us as clouds, must lose their finite character and blend with God. To attain their own perfection. But we need not fear that we can lose anything by the progress of the noble soul. That which is so beautiful, alike in nature and in man, must be succeeded and supplanted only by what is more beautiful, and so on forever. Abbreviations Brown, Art Jr., GDM, The Great Dionysiac Myth. London, Longmans, 1877-8. RMA, the Religion and Mythology of the Aryans of Northern Europe, 1880. R.Z., The Religion of Zoroaster, 1879. Cox, Reverend Sir G. W. M. A. N. Mythology of the Aryan Nations. Introd. Introduction to Mythology in Folklore, 1881. Cousins, J. E. H. H., The Handbook of Heraldry. Dharmasteter, J. O. E. T. A. Ormas D. T. Araman. Dennis, G., C. C. E., Cities and Cemeteries of Etruria, edit. 1878. Fosbroke, Rev. T. D., E. A., Encyclopedia of Antiquities. Gillam, J. Hitch, A Display of Heraldry, edit. 1660. King, C. W., A. G. R., Antique Gems and Rings. Muller, Professor M., LSL, Lectures on the Science of Language, 6th edit. Rawlinson, Rev. Professor, A. M., Ancient Monarchies. Ruskin, J., Q. A., The Queen of the Air. Schliemann, H., M., and T. Mycenae and Tyrans. Smith, G., C. A. G., Chaldean Account of Genesis, 2nd edit. Tyler, E. B., P. C., Primitive Culture. FR, The Egyptian Funereal Ritual. Translated by Dr. Birch. 
R.P., Records of the Past. London, Bagster and Sons, 1873-81. TSBA, Transactions of the Society of Biblical Archaeology. W.A., Cuneiform Inscriptions of Western Asia.